Welcome everyone to the Antinatalist Advocacy Podcast, where we speak to interesting and knowledgeable people about how best to protect sentient beings from the harms of coming into existence. I am your host, John, an antinatalist advocate from the UK, and I'll be the main host of the podcast going forward. Back in December, in episode six of this podcast, we hosted a crossover episode with Lenny and Carlos, the guys behind Voidcast, where we talked about the antinatalist community in general. Lenny also had some constructive feedback on AA specifically that we unfortunately didn't have time to cover, and we decided, rather than try and cram everything into one episode, where Lawrence and I would hand over the reins and allow Lenny and fellow antinatalist conundrum to put their criticisms to us. That's what we're bringing you today. I think it's really important to create a culture of well-meaning criticism in the antinatalist community. I certainly haven't got all the answers, so I thought this was a really valuable opportunity to get some feedback on AA and suggestions for us going forward. I'd really like to thank Lenny and Conundrum for taking part in the discussion. Please let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Anyway, without further ado, I bring you episode 10 of the Antinatalist Advocacy Podcast with Lenny and Conundrum. Enjoy. Right, so welcome everyone to this video. So this video is going to be a discussion really on uh, criticisms or, or feedback, however one would want to put it, that um, Conundrum and Lenny have been kind enough to, to give up some of their time to bring to myself and John. Um, so I think Lenny's going to provide a bit more context as to how this uh, discussion came about but essentially what we will be uh, doing in this video is uh, Lenny Conundrum and also Mark who uh, is not joining us today um, but Mark did help uh, put some of the work in behind the scenes they've um, put some feedback and criticisms together for antinatalist advocacy and our activities so far the ideas behind it i would assume the approach um i'm sure there's a, a wide plethora of, of aspects that they're going to bring up points to um and yeah so john and i are here with with lenny and conundrum and i'll quickly let lenny and then conundrum introduce themselves and then uh, uh you guys can take over and and we can go from there so lenny do you want to go first just do a quick intro of yourself yes sure so I'm Lenny and over the past one and a half or two years, maybe I've kept myself busy with um, a couple of projects more or less uh, related to antinatalist literature, but I also run a podcast together with my friend Carlos. Uh, it's called Voidcast, and, but I'm not here to advertise my show. <laughs> I just want to say that um, it was kind of in this function that I appeared together with Carlos on John's antenatalist advocacy podcast last year. And in that episode, we talked about not only our show, but also about um, our criticisms of the antenatalist community and our doubts and skepticism, especially about the limitations of uh, the advocacy of such a position. And while we were recording, we were noticing that we were running out of time and because we had originally planned to have a section on our criticisms for uh, Lawrence's and John's organization, specifically antenatalist advocacy, but it turned out uh, it would make more sense to do a separate episode or a separate discussion on that. So I was tasked with putting together uh, a criticism panel, which you're listening to right now. And so yeah, this is kind of the natural uh, sequel or the necessary sequel, perhaps, to the Voidcast crossover episode on uh, John's podcast. Now, over the course of this discussion, we're going to go through um, a couple of points, uh, yeah, some of which have to do with the way you present yourselves. Um, others 
with what you stand for and perhaps errors to avoid, associations to consider and to avoid, um, and a couple of other topics as well. So we're going to kind of go from the more superficial issues to some of the more fundamental issues. And, um, but, you know, just uh, so you know, some of the things that I'm going to say, you might expect to come from uh, perhaps from a place of bad faith, um, because there can be quite like fundamental criticism. But, uh, you know, just so you know, uh, I'm not interested in uh, tearing down what others build up. And I'm here today in my constructive uh, capacity. Cool. Cheers for that, Lenny. Um, conundrum, do you want to do a quick intro and any sort of um, additional intro to add, to, 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 to add some bits or whatever the phrase is? Hello, hello. I'm Conundrum. I am interested in philosophical pessimism and I am an antinatalist and a vegan. I run a YouTube channel called Conundrum where I post videos mostly on philosophical topics or issues. And I'm really glad to be here. Cool. Cheers for that. Um, all right, Lenny, I don't know if um, you guys want to alternate. It's completely up to you, but I'll, we can just hand over to you um, and take it away with the first thing you want to bring up. So, yeah, um, at first we wanted to talk a bit about the way you present yourselves. And perhaps it would make sense first to talk about the name and the meaning of antinatalist advocacy. And maybe I should uh, give the floor to you, uh, Conundrum. Yeah, so it would be great to start with how do you both define antinatalism? Do you want to go first, John? Yeah, sure. I think my understanding of antinatalism is that it is morally a bad thing to do to bring new sentient beings into existence. Um, I could go into more detail than that. Um, basically, you know, there's different reasons for why I believe that is the case, but I think we'll, we'll start from that. I think it is morally a bad thing to do to bring new sentient beings into existence. Yeah, and I, I my um, sort of definition I always um, operate under and, and give to people when they ask is, um, the view that it's a harm to come into existence and as a result it is uh, unethical to bring new sentient beings into existence. Right. So currently on the page Why Antinatalism, we have antinatalism defined as the view that coming into existence is a harm and that it is better to never exist than to come into existence. So don't you think that maybe this definition that is currently on the page doesn't exactly accurately reflect what in general philosophers think about not antinatalism and how we uh, just seen you understand antinatalism to me? Yes, that is a good point. And that is exactly why at the moment we're doing a... Uh... Uh, review of the website there's been a tiny bit of change so far but we've actually held off on a lot of these substantive changes uh, until this panel because uh, well for two reasons one we knew that you guys had already prepared um, and we didn't want to change things on the website and you know that you would have been bringing up and sort of sweep the rug from under your feet um, and the the second thing is is obviously um, we wanted to wait and hear what you guys uh, wanted to bring up and discuss. Uh, and so there might be things from this discussion we, that we then use to inform the changes on the website. Um, so rather than do a change before and after this discussion, we've left most of the changes until this discussion was had. Um, so, yeah, that is completely valid. And we're going to be reviewing that Um yeah, agree. Totally fair criticism. I do believe, I think the second part of that definition of the website is quite strange, uh, that it is better not to exist than to, to be born. Not that I disagree with that, but I don't think that's uh, necessarily a key part of the, like the definition of antinatalism. So yeah, we totally agree. Right, but during this discussion, we will just take the meaning of antinatalism or 
understanding of what antinatalism is to what you just said as the responses to the question, right? Yeah, yeah, that's all good. So that's, yeah, so that's one thing that we will have clear and it will be the basis maybe for the discussion. So one other thing is since the organization is antinatalist advocacy, the obvious question now is how do you do antinatalist advocacy? Uh, I'm happy to go first if you wanted, Lawrence. Cool. You want to be yeah, talking? yeah. Sure. So I think, you know, we've got two broad aims with antinatalist advocacy. And I think the first aim is primarily to build a platform for people who identify as antinatalists to be able to do good, to uh, look at cause areas that where we think that antinatalism has an important part to play. So, for example, with you know, human suffering or animal agriculture, etc., where we don't need to be bringing beings into existence, an important perspective on wild animal suffering as well. Uh, and to look for opportunities, primarily donating money, but using careers, etc., to have an impact on those. Um, and the second goal, which is actually, it's less of a direct aim and more of a, uh, like a secondary outcome of doing that, is by... Uh, influencing or like propagating the idea of antinatalism within these different cause areas uh, so it's not like a direct aim of ours to go out and make more antinatalists or to really to propagate antinatalism as such but rather as a secondary aim of antinatalists taking more action to do good and getting involved in these conversations the idea of antinatalism will spread if that makes sense I can totally understand with the name of the organization that the secondary aim looks like the primary one or that people would think that our main aim would be to spread antinatalism. But I think that is more of a secondary positive outcome of that first aim, which is antinatalists trying to do good, basically. We are also going to discuss like possible name, name changes uh, later on. That sounds good. Yeah, and... Um... Yeah, so the only the only thing I'd add on on top of that is, um, yeah, obviously, um, as as John's already laid out, we've got sort of two core like aims, um, and the way that I see antinatalist advocacy feeding into the organisation, uh, as in lowercase a on both of those, um, is one in some ways we will advocate for antinatalism itself, but as John said, like a core thing we want to do is help facilitate antinatalists to become advocates or people who do uh, good or more good than they're currently doing. Because um, obviously, you know, some antinatalists are doing good, as I've, you know, I've sort of discussed with you before, Conundrum. Um, but there will be other antinatalists who aren't um, uh, sort of intentionally trying to make the world a better place um, in general or with, with antinatalism in mind. So, um, that's one way that we think the organization also feeds into um, advocating for antinatalism is, is helping others do that. Um, another thing on the name is um, a very uh, simple and basic point um, is obviously the name will encapsulate some of the meaning behind an organization, but a name also needs to be things like, like you've got to also think about it from a branding perspective as in, you know, um, it was a long time since I did my English GCSE, but it's alliteration, right? Where it's two, yes. two of the uh, same um, letters starting. Um, and it's a short, you know, to the point, has antinatalism in the name, this sort of stuff. Um, so when we were having discussions about naming the organization, those things also played a part as well as it needs to be related to what we're doing. Um, so, yeah, that's ultimately why we went with uh, AA. Yeah, uh, we get into yeah, that's what I've got to add. We get into the linguistic uh, aspects uh, perhaps later on, but uh, Conundrum, would you like to uh, go on? Yeah, sure. So another point that is very much related to what you just described, A A to B, is the problem of the goal. There are often. We often see organizations that have very specific goals, such as eradicate malaria or 
eliminate poverty or this or that. So these are the things that some day in the future, in the potential future, you can say that you either accomplished or you have some work still to do. But it doesn't really seem that you have something like that. It doesn't look like you have a goal that you will know that you have achieved. Or in other words, at which point would you consider your mission to have been successful? So I think my um, take on this is that an organization doesn't necessarily need to have um, a specific point at which they know our work will definitely be done when we've gotten to this exact point. So, you know, there are organizations that come to mind um, that, wouldn't have such a goal so uh for example um an organization that is promoting um freedom of speech or freedom of expression um you know maybe that will take the form of supporting certain publishing houses or whatever um it doesn't seem clear to me that they would have any sort of fixed point that they're aiming at they're just generally trying to nurture some certain value or or, or thing right like i think aa is trying to do um, another thing may be in um, to bring it to effective altruism, um, you know, there are uh, career services like animal advocacy careers or 80,000 hours. Now, they as organizations may have um, specific aims like you're talking about that they want to achieve, you know, a certain number of, of whatever. Um, but they also have this general aim of helping people into careers to try and do good in the world. Right. Um, I don't necessarily think that has to have a specific um, and finite aim or objective or goal in the way you're putting forward. Um, I think it's very, you know, I, th I think it's acceptable to have a have a general um, aim or something you want to to nurture as AA does. Um, but John, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I definitely agree. I was thinking of charities. Uh, as you said, Conundrum, that have clear goals. So if you think of, I don't know, meningitis now that wants to you know, eradicate meningitis or against Malaria Foundation that wants to eradicate malaria, those charities do lend themselves to those kind of hard goals. But as Lawrence said, um, organizations that are attached to ideas, in particular, I'm thinking of think tanks, uh, an organization like the Sentience Institute that's trying to spread moral, um, like moral circle expansion, I'm not sure that they will get to a point when they say, okay, these ideas have spread enough, which is obviously, as I said, like a prime, a, a secondary goal of AA, the idea of, sp of spreading antinatalism. But then in terms of a primary goal of creating that platform, as Lawrence said, like an 80,000 hours type platform, I don't think that 80,000 hours would say, you know, when every, every person that exists going forward accesses our platform, we know that we've achieved or oh, whatever it is you know so i think it's fine not to have necessarily a clearly defined end point when we can say right our work is done yeah that makes total sense so now i have a, a topic that is much smaller or much more narrower which we can find on the current version of the of the website on the page who we are where you introduce the concept the antinatalist blind spot it seems to be very important for you because it's at the very top and it's bold and when i'm thinking about some uh, something like that i already think about something that humane hancock introduced which is called the vegan blind spot. And this means that vegans have a certain blind spot. So vegans don't see, in this case, vegans don't see the harm that wild animals are going through, but they focus only on farm animals. So it's just the phrase, the antinatalist blind spot, seems to be saying something like something very similar something like something that antinatalists miss or don't see or ignore 
So um, that's actually a, an interesting one because um, I I'm aware of um, I, I sort of um, I'm aware of of Jack's work and stuff, and I'm aware of his um, you know he's done a talk at Vegan Campau about the vegan blind spot, and I know he's used that term. And actually, to be honest, I can't remember if either John or I or came up with that term or we heard it somewhere. I can't remember. Um, but I've actually never in my mind associated it with. Uh, Jack's use of the term vegan blind spot. Um, so that's quite interesting. You make that that link, um, but um, yeah, on the um, on the uh, on the website, um, we yeah we use that term, and and I we're not using it to say that antinatalists have a blind spot. We're saying that it's a blind spot that. Um, uh, we're saying that antinatalism is is a blind spot. Well, there are points that antinatalism raise that is a blind spot to people. So um, I can quote what we have on the website, and let's just see if it does um, if it does convey the the message that we're trying to uh, trying to convey. Because um, if not, then then that will be something we'll need to change as well. So it says, um, whilst many people are working to do good in the world, we believe many people have an ethical blind spot, the antinatalist blind spot. Harm to an individual can be mitigated once they exist, and doing so is important. But the only guaranteed way to ensure a sentient being is not harmed is to, is, uh, to simply not create them in the first place. Um, so to me, and maybe, you know, maybe it's because I was involved in writing this that it seems clear to me, but and so maybe it isn't clear to other people. But to me, that seems clear that it's talking about a blind spot of people who are existing people who are um trying to do good in the world and have not quite um made the connection with the fact that you know it's like david benatar's quote you know whilst good people go to great lengths to um you know avoid their child coming to harm obviously i'm butchering the quote now um but the you know they don't realize that the only way to avoid the child coming to any harm is not to create them in the first place um so he sort of talks about what i would refer to as the antinatalist blind spot there obviously he doesn't use that term but it's the same sort of principle, if that makes sense. So we're not talking about a blind spot that antinatalists have. We're talking about a blind spot that people have or people who are trying to do good have generally in that they're trying to um, mitigate suffering and harm once it's here rather than not creating individuals um, to experience the harm in the first place, if that makes sense. I don't know if you have anything yeah, to add, John. It oh, makes total sense just by reading what is on the page currently. I'm, I was just asking because the antinatalist blind spot sounds like such a cool catchphrase or a slogan that could be very, very useful. But when you say this uh, slogan without all the elaborate explanation, then someone who hasn't heard it yet may be very confused what it would mean don't you think i was going to say i do agree conundrum the, the way it's phrased it does sound like uh there is a blind spot that antinatalists have i think a couple of reasons for maybe sticking with the wording as it is currently of antinatalist blind spot is one we don't necessarily have a clear clearly identified group of people where people will associate with the label um, who have this blind spot. So with the Humane Hancock example, he is addressing vegans, self-identified vegans. They are a clear group of people who identify with a vegan label and saying, you have a blind spot. The problem with the, like the, so it would be groups of people who are trying to do good who don't currently consider the points that David Benatar made around the only way to protect, to guarantee a being doesn't, experience any harm it's not to create them in the first place and they're not necessarily a defined group of people that with like a self-identified label if that makes sense and also just because antinatalism and the, the the word antinatalist is you know for us in the community you remember that we are a very tiny fringe community and not many people have heard about this phrase at all um so i, I wonder if there's some merit of just having it in there Anyway, it might cause some confusion to an antinatalist who already is familiar with the term, but then they won't have the blind spot because they'll be an antinatalist. Whereas if we use that phrase with non-antinatalists, then there is a chance people are like, what's an antinatalist? What's antinatalism, etc. But I don't know. 
I, I definitely what, agree with your point, though, Conundrum, that it can be confusing. Yeah, w- one final thing I'll just add is that, um, I mean, the the reason that that term is used was to convey a certain message to people, right? Um, and so if it's not doing that job, if it's causing confusion to someone who's, you know, like, I consider you, Conundrum, a very intelligent person. So if it's causing confusion to to someone like you, then it may be causing confusion to a lot of other people as well. So, um, you know, whether or not we'll we'll stop using that term on the website is another thing, but I'm not, you know, wedded to that specific term. If we can convey the same message in different words, then then we can do that in the website review. Um, I actually, until you raised it just now, I actually didn't realize that it had caused this confusion with anyone. I thought it was relatively clear, but maybe that's just me taking it for granted because I was involved in helping write it in the first place. Um, right, yeah. and I think that good phrase, good phrases that can be put, for example, on um, during street activism or whatever so uh, short slogans that convey a very specific and clear meaning uh, something like that if you had that could be very useful um, maybe to put on the stickers or on twitter or here and there but if i hear as a normal <laughs> let's say as a normal person as someone who doesn't really know much about the topic if i hear the phrase the antinatalist blind spot i'm not really informed very much about what's going on so maybe maybe some other phrases could be developed by you guys and used maybe in either instead or in addition to this one because it uh, of course for me it sounds great but i fear that people who don't know much about the topic probably they will not um, receive it very well yeah no i I get what you mean i think to be honest um we're probably never going to come up with a single term that is going to fully encapsulate what we're trying to get across there which is why the antinatalist blind spot on the website at the moment is encapsulated within a sort of slightly larger paragraph um so yeah we'll we'll have a think about how to reword it and stuff but i'm not sure we're ever going to get to a point where we have a specific word or two or three word phrase that is going to fully capture that um i think it's just one of those things that probably like humane hancocks like if someone said to um to someone the vegan blind spot they wouldn't necessarily know he was specifically talking about wild animal suffering um so a, a lot of these sorts of phrases will have to have a sl- you know a bit more context um but yeah we, we we can review it and um and and make it make it more clear um yeah i think that such phrases are very useful for example some vegan activists or organizations use the phrase meat is murder and if you hear that you right. have absolutely no ambiguity in your head yeah. what would that mean and yeah, this is a very, very strong and of course controversial or polarizing phrase but it conveys the meaning accurately yes no that's that's very true um i think some some ideas are easier to encapsulate in short phrases like that than others i think this one might be a slightly harder one um but if we'll have a think about it and if if either of you guys have any suggestions please let us know either now or or later um and anyone listening as well please do uh, put it in the comment yeah, section yeah. okay we have dwelt uh, quite long on this uh, specific uh, phrase maybe we can move on um, to something more general and uh, stay a bit on the website which i think looks very slick so uh, good job um, but there is a panel that says um, criticisms coming soon. And it's been like that for about half a year now, like since the uh, the inception of um, antenatalist advocacy. And like to an outsider and even to me, it looks a bit like an organization that is kind of trying to present itself as like oh look we really care about critiques and feedback and criticism but at the moment it's 
it seems like more like a placeholder, um, like an alibi almost. And uh, I hope that this will be kind of changed in the future. And I also hope that the criticism panel that we are doing right now won't serve an alibi function either, if that makes sense. Can I quickly clarify what you mean by this panel serving as an alibi function? Um, that we're having right now, our discussion. So if we but, were to link to that on the website, would that be like an no, alibi? I mean, that, that would be fine. Um, the, the question is kind of what... Now, I mean, we are going to address uh, and discuss some of the more like substantial um, issues too. And I mean... I don't think it's enough to simply refer people to a discussion that you had, but also like if nothing comes out of it, it may seem a bit like um, it was only done for kind of ostentative uh, purposes, if that makes sense. So, you know, just be mindful of that, of having an empty criticism uh, section. Yes, no, definitely. I do think uh, we haven't decided until obviously we are we are posting this video um, and we're, you know, we're very grateful for you coming on to give us as you said, like well-meaning criticisms we've also got a podcast episode coming up hopefully with a guest who disagrees with antinatalism and effective altruism so uh quite a, quite a few different voices who, who criticize our approach and um, very good i do think that we need to it, it wouldn't i totally agree it wouldn't be enough to say to people oh we care about criticism they're buried somewhere in this two hour long video however long mm -hmm. this is going to be so i do think that we need to think carefully about how we make those criticisms visible and accessible mm -hmm. and also show where we have considered them and any changes we have made as a result of the criticisms that we need. I definitely agree that it could, okay. if all of our criticisms were hid somewhere, then it could just look like a token gesture. Yeah, exactly. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And then just, just very quickly. So um, yeah, John sort of covered that ground um, and uh, yeah, very quickly on the, um, criticisms uh, button. I I think you were using the word panel, Lenny, but I think because you were using okay. panel for this discussion as well, it got confusing. But the yeah. the the button on the website that that says uh, criticisms and, and coming too. soon, yeah, yeah, that is simply just. I'll be honest, us not getting round to it. There is no malintention or four D chess, <laughs> you know, happening behind that. As much as I know, s some people who may be watching this would like to think there is some 4D chess going on behind it. It, it is simply just we prioritized other things in the effort that we've already put into antinatalist advocacy so far. Now, um, I think it is a valid criticism to say that we haven't focused on that with um, with the effort we have put in so far, and I completely accept that. Um, to be honest, I think we, we should have done that by now. Um, and yeah, but we, we are where we are we we do want to take on criticism which is why we're having this um panel and and john's getting a, a guest on as he's mentioned um and, and we will rectify that on the website um as part of the as part of the website review um so all we can do is just apologize but yeah it's it even though it may look like uh, an alibi as you put it um it, it is not intended to be that and it is on us that we haven't got we haven't sort of attended to it um yet so that is a yeah that's completely valid but um no we're not we're not looking to use it as a as an alibi or anything okay um then another thing is like the, the very first thing uh, that i see when i open the website it says antinatalists wanting to do the most good and already in our uh, crossover episode uh, with voidcast on on your podcast, I already like expressed my reservations when it comes to this kind of superlative uh, language with doing the most of this and maximizing that. I kind of, in a tongue-in-cheek way, uh, refer to it as uh, moral capitalism. Uh, and uh, the the thing, I mean, we we must keep in mind. John mentioned this earlier that antinatalists are a, a fringe group. Like we are far away from kind of what the vegan movement has has become we're, we're really still a very fringe minority we are the weirdos <laughs> essentially and i don't think for some reason i mean i don't think it is appropriate for such a fringe 
group to to speak of maximizing this or maximizing that if that makes sense so uh, maybe it's something like a bit more a bit more modest or a bit more humble would be more appropriate like let's try not to harm ourselves and others or something like that but you know doing the most of this maximizing that i don't think it it really aligns with what antinatalism and the antinatalist scene if there is such a thing is at at the moment so i'll just quickly go first john and then and then you can add add what you'd like to add um yeah, well, I think there's two comments I want to make here. Um, the first comment I want to make is when you were saying that's not where the antinatalist community is at. I mean, um, I understand that is the case, but one of the very things that John and I are setting out to do is to try and influence the antinatalist community so that people are more engaged in doing good. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is I, can, I think that is a completely valid thing of um, criticizing the use of the word most and this sort of mm -hmm. maximizing mentality. I completely get that. Um, and I like your sort of, um, imagery of, uh, did you say moral capitalism or ethical capitalism? Yes. I can't remember yes. exactly how moral you termed it. Yeah. Moral capitalism. Um, now obviously John and I put that word in there because we're not just wanting antinatalists to do good. We're wanting antinatalists to think about, doing good well doing good but thinking about it in a way and framing it in a way of how can i do this in an effective way or what can be more effective than i would otherwise be doing right so we could be saying we want antinatalists to do good and by that we mean go around and put stickers you know around your local city you know that may be doing some good who knows but that you know that's not what we're trying to get to we what we were trying to convey in my eyes is the fact that we want people to engage in doing good. We want, we want them to have this sort of general effectiveness mindset of um, how can I do good in such a way where I'm using my time and resources um, to do... I mean, I'm going to use the most because I can't think of a more um, adequate term, but I'm not using most in a maximizing way. I'm Maybe um john can you think of a better term like more good than if i hadn't have put any thought into it if you get what i mean um, yeah i think i think this is yeah. a a long and, and very valid criticism of effective altruism because what mm -hmm. they're trying to say is it's not enough to just try and do a little bit of good um just to poke fun lenny i was thinking we don't need moral capitalism we need moral communism <laughs> and i'll make sure that i don't do any more good than the person next to me and it's all the lowest common denominator. No, I'm just kidding. I, I wish I wish Carlos <laughs> was with us uh, here to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously, I, I do think this is a point. It's something that the effective altruists have struggled with is the wording of the most. And this is actually something mm -hmm. that we'll be going over with um, our guest at the uh, a later podcast episode. Is this kind mm -hmm. of maximizing terminology, the idea mm -hmm. that you have to keep doing good until your life is barely worth living, until your mm -hmm. margin giving giving to marginal utility is the phrase that um uh, yeah. effective altruists have sometimes used the idea that you give so much money that you're you're just as ba badly off as the very poor people that you're trying to help and there is yeah it, it's a hard thing positive obligations in general are quite hard so mm -hmm. i know that we touched on this before uh conundrum in the conversation we had on lawrence's channel around charity and saying that you don't necessarily need to think that you've got strong moral obligations to think that donating to charity is a, a good thing to do or a better thing to do. It's hard to really measure what those, for at least I personally and a lot of philosophers and people who think about this find it hard to say how much good is doing good. But there is something to be said about using the evidence and being ambitious in terms of achieving a large impact. But there is something off about the maximizing ideas and it's again, it's something that effective altruists have a, a very valid criticism of the whole philosophy of effective altruism in general. Yeah, and especially. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was going to say, and as as I think Lawrence showed, and it's not a knock on you, Lawrence, because lots of people struggle with this, trying to say doing more good than you otherwise would have done if you hadn't come across us or hadn't put these yeah, it's ideas. not as catchy it's, it's really clunky it's really clunky but that is it's more accurate but clunky and easy to misinterpret so definitely something for us to consider 
Um, I'm maybe, not sure if there are any easy options here. Maybe you could consider antenatalists wanting to do better. Oh, that feels well, a bit I mean, in so <laughs> yeah, and also that, I mean, I think that could mean so many other things. Okay, um, so I'm not a native speaker. Well. Maybe this was completely off. I just want no, to no. I it. mean, it's not it's not completely off. I, I I get what you're I get what you're getting at. I mean, um, I I mean, I don't know how much time you do want to spend. Like, I mean, we've got trying to, to find another just, word. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. but John and I like. We, I think both John and I understand your point and um, also have some of the same concerns. So mm -hmm. we'll think about. Um, how to reword that but it could be something like you know antinatalists wanting to do good effectively or something like that mm -hmm. um obviously at the end of the day whatever word we're going to use someone's probably going to come for us over it um just because wanting to do good effectively well then you know someone's gonna come at us and say you know how do you know that what you're doing is is effective um and sort of drill down on that um but uh, yeah, we'll we'll take it into consideration when we're doing the website review. Excellent. And there's one, um, th yeah, there's another um, issue that I would like to touch on because I think this is one of the more substantial um, sides, um, uh, substantial um, uh, um, aspects. And when I take a look at uh, at your logo, we see this uh, infinity sign, which is interrupted by a heart-shaped uh, symbol and it's very clear that you put a lot of emphasis on compassion and the role of compassion in antinatalism and in its advocacy and activism and this is something that um, I would like to uh, talk a bit about because um, I think it's not the link between antinatalism and compassion is not entirely clear. It's not, it's not really established. I mean, on the one hand, I do think it is valid uh, to say, well, take a look at the world, take a look at the state of the world, take a look at the misery of, uh, of our existence, and please make the, mo make the compassionate uh, decision in this regard that is not creating another life into existence. I think that's one thing. But um, I think we have to keep in mind that although the antenatalist position could be called maybe a, a um, kind of uh, ha to have a component of compassionate ethics, it's important to keep in mind that compassion is not necessarily the reason why someone is an antenatalist, nor does it mean that someone is automatically a compassionate person simply by virtue of being an antinatalist. And this is because quantifying compassion, how do you quantify compassion? Is This is a really an extremely complex uh, question. I can give you one example. <laughs> the example is myself. Um, for example, I, for example, I uh, am an antinatalist, I'm vegan, I've, I even do... Um, like street activism from time to time. Uh, I have donated uh, money to charity in the past, but can I truly claim that I'm compassionate or that I'm particularly compassionate? I don't think so. In fact, I have reason to believe that my own emotional cap capacities are somewhat limited. That is, I'm just not a not a particularly emotional person overall. I'm, and... Um, this doesn't mean I'm a, that I'm a psychopath or anything, but perhaps um, this kind of r reminds you of this uh, study carried out by um, uh, this uh, researcher Schoeniger, according to which there are negative statistically significant correlations between antinatalism and affective empathy. So this is extremely important to keep in mind when... Uh, you say things like um, antinatalists are compassionate, like almost by default or by definition. Antinatalists don't have a monopoly on compassion. It's not like being an antinatalist makes you compassionate or, or makes you smarter than everyone else. So please do not feed into this narrative of we are the supremely compassionate people and everyone else who is not an antinatalist um, is by definition, not compassionate, because this is kind of an open 
invitation to to all kinds of uh, like toxic um, uh, positivity and my buddy Andrew uh, actually compiled a video on I think it's called antenatalists are the most compassionate people where you can see some really bad examples of uh, people who on the one hand claim to be supremely compassionate people and while at the same time like having a contest for finding the most uh, vile and disgusting terms for parents or for children or whatever so be very very careful when playing the compassion card i would actually advise uh, against it especially um we may discuss this later when you bring um, kind of the genetic component into into the discussion but this is something that i would kind of uh, caution against against uh, kind of saying we we are the compassionate people just because it is a position of compassionate ethics I'm happy to start with this one, Lawrence. If you know. okay, yeah, go on. Um, do you think, Lenny, that some of the things, like from the logo alone, and not even from the logo, but from the from the way the website's laid out, do you think then that there is anything that would lead someone to believe from the website? Because I've definitely come across those claims before from people saying we antinatalists are so smart, we're so compassionate, everyone else so is so. It, and and I think just... that's quite common. I've, I've found the same in left-wing groups. I've found the same mm -hmm. in atheist groups. I've found mm -hmm. the same in vegan groups. I think it's quite common yeah. for people who are united around ideas to say, no, we are the enlightened ones. Everyone else is either mm -hmm. stupid or um, stupid or uh, what, uh, what the opposite of compassionate. What, what's the phrase? Sadistic. Uncompassionate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uncompassionate. Cruel. You know, cruel. Yeah. cruel. Exactly. I think it's quite common in places united by ideas. And I think mm. our aim with the logo wasn't to say that only antinatalists are compassionate or anything like that. But if anything, it's to try and counter some of those things that you have said, Lenny, which, mm. you know, I absolutely agree. You know, the, the subreddits and different places, antinatalist spaces can be full of yeah. horrible language about non-antinatalists, hatred towards children, which I've never personally understood, um, you know, violent fantasies towards non-antinatalists, all this kind of thing. So I, I wonder, I, I do agree with your point that someone could look at the logo and read into it that we're saying that we're the best, but I also think there's a point, and the point that we're trying to get across, that there is a compassionate side to antinatalism. I do think it is a compassionate action to put aside your own desire to bring other beings into existence for ethical reasons. Yeah, I think none um, of us can test that. Yeah. Can I? Can and I? Do, quick... you, do you think that us using oh, the just just to ask for this, Lenny, and then I'll let Kevin Lawrence. I'm just saying, do you think that us trying to put across that more compassionate side by again? I, I think that we are quite fair in our mm -hmm. discussions and in in a way that we the, the content that we've put out about you know being nice about non antinatalists about I don't know you know yeah it's. The, the, I, I think that up... we, we try and live those compassionate ethics, and I think there's a point to trying to put across that more compassionate side, both for antinatalists uh, and also for non-antinatalists. They do come across a, a side of antinatalism that isn't full of the negative traits that you uh, mm -hmm. identified. So, um, if I may say uh, just one or two words, like um, it wasn't only the logo; it's it's just a, f um, a phrase or a term that comes up very often, also in your podcast and your other. Um, content so it's just something that I would kind of warn you about uh, not to f to play into this trap between saying like, like um, lumping together these two things on the one hand a compassionate uh, a, a decision that can be characterized as compassionate on the one hand and compassionate people on the other hand because um, I, I think it's claiming that antinatalists are compassionate I think this is this is quite a bold claim uh, at the moment, and so I. And I don't think it's a claim that I would. Yeah. The, the, the evidence suggests the yeah, opposite yeah. in terms of people who identify I mean, with the label. So I don't yeah, yeah, I mean the evidence. I think I was more thinking in terms of like actions rather than people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, actions rather than compassionate people. Yeah. And can, can I? Okay. Can so, I? I just wanted to quickly. I just wanted to quickly add as well. Is personally, I think Lenny, what you may have done is sort of. Um, taken one specific um and probably uncommon interpretation of the logo um, no, I, I, and I, run I, with I, it I quite far. I was not talking only about the logo. It's a phrase that comes up constantly. Constantly. 
It's not just the logo. Which, which, which phrase? Compassionate antinatalism. Yeah, and we want to stress the compassionate side of things. So I, I just use the the logo yeah, as a so nice it's... kind of link between this section and the next section of this panel discussion. Mm. Right. Yeah. So I think. I mean, I, I guess we've already kind of gone gone over it, or John John's gone over it. But um, I mean, I whenever that when we put the logo together or whenever that term has been used personally i've never interpreted that as meaning that antinatalists are some sort of compassionate super race or something um i have always only made the connection of it being a decision uh based on compassion or with compassionate considerations underpinning it um which i think is um the intention we always had when when using that phrase when either john or i have used that phrase um personally i have never come across anyone who's made the other interpretation about it as a fr I've, I've heard people claim that antinatalists are more compassionate but when people have used the term compassionate antinatalism i've personally never seen it be an issue that people misunderstand that to mean that they're claiming antinatalists are more compassionate than everyone else. I think that mm -hmm. might just be a miss, miss sort of understanding of, of what the intended uh, phrasing is, unless mm -hmm. someone specifically says otherwise. But I, uh, to be honest, I've never, ever heard anyone use that phrase to, to mean the way that you were talking about. Okay. I think my comments in the last uh, episode, which I'm sure we're about to get to, Lenny, have not confused things in that re this regard. No, we, we, we'll talk certainly, about... certainly how we've been using it in the past has always been in terms of actions rather than people. Yeah, I mean, we're going to talk about uh, ecological niches and sperm banks uh, maybe later on. But yeah, I mean, I just wanted to stress that because um, it's important to keep in mind that compassion may not be the only or the driving motivation that leads someone to accept the antinatalist conclusion. I think there's more or usually more at play there. So Yes, but I just just again to clarify is we're not saying that compassion is the only reason. What we're mm -hmm. we're trying to encourage people to make that decision based on compassion. If you get what I mean. Like okay, we yeah. we could be we could be trying to encourage people to make that decision based on misanthropy, you know if we convince people based on misanthropy, it would have the same outcome of their, you know, not them not producing another sentient being, but we're, we're trying to encourage it, you know, based on compassion. Mm -hmm. um, and also just to mean. generally act compassionately. I mean, there's a lack, I, I totally agree, Lenny. I think there can be a lack of compassion in within the antinatalist community towards fellow antinatalists and definitely to people outside of the community. So I think there's probably maybe if compassion is a, is a word that, uh, you know people feel uncomfortable around and i do understand mm -hmm. why people might feel uncomfortable around it i think there is something to be said for just being you know spreading norms of being nice mm -hmm. nice within and outside of the community as antinatalists yeah um, which kind of brings me to to the next point because um on your website and in on your podcast and elsewhere you often say things like antinatalists should do this, antinatalists should do that, antinatalists should consider this, antinatalists should care about that. And um, I mean, I take a bit of issue with this uh, phrase because um, I mean, either antinatalists care about something by definition, or it's something that everyone should care about. So it's it's something that um, is not exclusive, kind of exclusive to to antinatalists. Like antinatalists should care about being decent human beings. Yes, of course, but everyone should. It's not 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 or, or antinatalists should not um, entertain violent fantasies. Yes, that's true, but like no one should. And so so I think it's kind of important to to st stress that it's not like there's like certain ethical rules or ethical like like that, that we play by different ethical rules or different ethical principles like spe special rules that only apply to us yeah no i i, I get what you mean i don't mm -hmm. think when you know i mean um again we're doing a website review so whenever we come across things like that we'll we'll 
um, sort of judge as to whether we think it's appropriate and it, it needs to change or not. But um, in, in general, when we're addressing antinatalists specifically, it's not because we think only antinatalists need to be nice, for example, is just one example. Um, it's just that antinatalists are our general audience, um, mm -hmm. right? Because th th those are the people that we're generally, who generally pay attention to us and who we're generally trying to address, not that they're the only, you know, people that we're trying to address. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think we're trying to specifically target antinatalists in terms of them being the only individuals who, who we mm -hmm. think should adopt these things or nurture these sort of values or approaches or behaviors. Um, it's just that there are, there are audience, um, okay. just like if someone's a socialist and they're talking to other socialists, they would probably, you know, address all of their recommendations for socialists, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I see. But I also nonetheless, think, I think okay. it's important to to kind of keep that in mind. Definitely. And I think there is also a point about the wording. Like just looking at one example where we say should, thinking about, we say there are two key reasons why the mm -hmm. issue of wild animal suffering should be of grave concern for antinatalists. Now, this is obviously what Lawrence and I believe. And we could go for a yeah. softer wording of this is why we, we say believe. could. Yeah, or yeah, could or whatever. Could be of concern, or or we believe. So there are definitely ways of um, yeah. suffering mm -hmm. that. I have used we believe quite a lot in writing in the past, or I believe. And then I've got people push back and say, well, obviously you believe this, because otherwise you wouldn't be saying it. Um, so I do I do get the idea, though, of that this should seems like quite a strong statement. Yeah, and we and we can, we, you know, we, like everything we discuss today we're completely open with to mm -hmm. reviewing things on the website or generally so when we go when we go through the website we'll we'll review all that sort of um language uh with with that in mind now you've brought it up okay um conundrum do you do we want to move on to the next uh point yeah sure mm -hmm. so um kind of we, we covered a bit um uh, that uh, concerns the way the way you present yourselves but i think what is perhaps even more important is um what you represent and what you stand for like your your values and i sometimes get the idea and if i'm not mistaken john actually admitted uh, to, to it in one of the uh, more recent podcast episodes is that uh, that you kind of entertain uh and promote a bit of an idealized image of the internatalist community and i think that this is kind of a bit at odds with kind of the actual state uh, and what what's what's going on uh, in these in these places so um i wonder are you kind of mm, trying or do you want to be the friendly and nice and handsome uh, public face of the otherwise quite ugly body of antinatalism can, can i um i just want to quickly um clarify because i'm not sure i'm entirely understanding um when when you say um that you get the vibe and that john sort of ad admitted mm -hmm. it um i'd also maybe question the use of the word admit just um well, okay yeah. it sort of implies I mean... something quite negative but um what can you give some examples what what do you mean exactly um, I mean, when you take a look at what's going on in the places where the majority of participants identify as internatalists, whether it's on Facebook or whether it's on um, Discord or Reddit, you find a lot of disgusting stuff. You'll, you'll find a lot of people who are in a, in a really bad place. You find a lot of people who are not in the slightest interested in uh, philosophy at all and who are just kind of using it um, to, as an ideological excuse of sorts to to vent their um, frustrations in life and sometimes even their uh, violent uh, fantasies and th kind of this is this is uh, what we are dealing with it's not just a myth spread by the evil pronatalist uh, mafia who uh, wants to kind of uh, break all of our efforts but it's like it's actually happening and can so, it, Lenny, so i wonder yeah 
Oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't I didn't want to interrupt. I just wanted to um, just quickly ask you, though, but do you think that we are trying to misrepresent how the antinatalist community actually is? Because let, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. In the conference um, yeah. that we put together, there were only six panels, right? And we chose to use one of those panels mm -hmm. uh, for a um, panel discussion on how to have a healthier antinatalist community mm -hmm. um you know where issues were raised about the community so mm -hmm. um personally and again if if you have thing things to bring up that sort of you know um question what i'm what i'm saying pl please do that because i'm not you know this mm -hmm. is um i you know i'm not trying to uh, gaslight anyone or anything yeah. but personally i don't feel like we w are trying to misrepresent how the antinatalist community actually is i think we're fully aware of the downsides of it and that's one of the things we want to try and influence is so that the you know influence mm -hmm. the community so that it, it has healthier dynamics but i think nonetheless like the the actual state of things is Im important to keep um in mind because this is one of the things uh, that are responsible for the kind of the very limited uh, um potential uh, that i think antinatalism as a social idea or social movement or uh, however you want to call it has and um yeah so so this is just something that that i think is important to to keep in mind that when we talk about building healthy communities there's only so much we can do with when the individuals in that community are kind of in need of help themselves you know uh, especially if your mission is to to do good and help others um i think yeah like we is uh, we must be aware of the inherent limitations there yeah no no i i 100 percent agree and and look any effort that john and i or antinatalist ad antinatalist advocacy generally makes to try and uh, help or facilitate antinatalists do good or do more good than they're currently doing obviously it takes two to tango like we're not going to reach people who simply don't want to you know have anything to do with us or or want to engage in those activities so that is an inherent limitation but i think that's an inherent limitation with any activity of of, of trying to engage others in in not even just doing good but trying to engage others in, in general um even if you're trying to put together a sports team for example um so yeah i think john and i are both are both aware of that and we are um hopefully you know um going forward going to have a positive influence on on the community and however limited a way that is hopefully it won't be um massively limited um but yeah yeah i think yeah we're both aware of of the fact that the antinatalist community won't um in its entirety want to engage in the activities that we want to promote um and yeah look i i mean the way i see it um antinatalism as a philosophical position is really just kind of an offshoot of traditional um philosophical um pessimism and a position like this is always going to attract its fair share of let's put it uh, like uh, negativity and so i think it does not i, I don't think uh, it does make a lot of sense to kind of present it to to, or to to want to make it more presentable than it actually can be like due to to these to these um limitations and for example john uh, calls himself the the positive pessimist and you know i already uh, kind of expressed my 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 doubts uh, regarding the kind of the an attempted positive rebranding of antinatalism i mean positive rebranding of um or, or positive branding of veganism and effective altruism and other things other um uh, ethical issues cause areas however you want to call it i think make more sense than in the context of antinatalism specifically due to its kind of inherent uh, negative uh, um elements whether it's uh, kind of inherent to the philosophical position or simply kind of the, the kind of people it att it attracts and the kind of mood it brings with it so this is just something that i think we 
must keep in mind that it's not it's never going to to appeal to to the masses in in a way that other ethical issues would if I can jump in, I do agree with a lot of what you said there, Lenny. And I, I maybe, as you said, the positive pessimist, maybe I am naively optimistic, um, which is maybe a rare thing to hear for antinatalists. <laughs> um, but I do, in terms of like representing the community or trying a rebrand, that, that's one thing that I've definitely seen in terms of criticisms of AA is that mm -hmm. we are trying to, in some way, put ourselves forward as leaders or something like this and i don't think that's necessarily the case i mean we are putting our ideas out there and people are absolutely free to tear them apart and disagree and ignore us etc um, and i think this might come up later in terms of our own positions on things um we definitely don't claim ownership of the antinatalist label or mm -hmm. to say that we are trying to put ourselves forward as a shiny happy base of the antinatalist community we're just trying to put our ideas out there put forward mm -hmm. what we think is a positive version of antinatalism mm -hmm. and if people value that then they can they can get on board i guess yeah and can i can i also just um say as well i think we also need to be careful of sort of um slipping into a sort of tall poppy syndrome uh, approach to the antinatalist community right um because I think if we maintain the mindset of, you know, antinatalism is inherently negative and, you know, it's a very rigid community and it's got so much wrong with it and all this sort of stuff, which can be true. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, you know, I, I don't think we need to sort of wallow in it, if you get what I mean. I think yeah, we yeah. can recognize. Yeah, I think we can recognize those things and and want to improve the situation and, and like change make, make them positive yeah. or constructive contributions yeah absolutely exactly I mean, yeah uh, that does make a lot of sense so um something that um i was wondering is what kind of function what kind of role um do you want to play with your organization because it's not the first and certainly not the only antinatalist organization um, in the world. I mean, there is Stop Having Kids. Um, there is, or at least was, antinatalism international. And uh, on the other hand, which we uh, might uh, go into later, there are also a couple of organizations with this effective altruism approach that um, are concerned with the reduction of, of suffering. So I'm, I'm curious, like, where do you see yourself in that kind of range, in that spectrum of uh, organizations, what do you want to do differently? Yeah, I'm happy to speak here. So I think definitely for the first year, uh, Lawrence and I talked about like having a body of work and we're not saying it's a huge amount of work. Again, this is something that we're doing in our spare time. Uh, and Lawrence has got his own YouTube channel, which understandably has a lot more content than we've been putting out, but kind of wanted to show like share our ideas, see how people react to our ideas, things like the conference, obviously, and the podcast. Um, so, But as we said, primarily our main goal is to be that platform uh, supporting antinatalists to take action. So something like, uh, I think Lawrence already mentioned this organization, Animal Advocacy Careers, where they support um, animal advocates, to, well, people who are interested in helping animals to have careers, um, really is some sort of kind of, activism style hub and we've got different ways of doing this which we will talk mm -hmm. about in a bit more sorry to be cagey but you know yeah. we, we you can say for this first year that we've been going since july last year and um, we're definitely in the ideas dissemination kind of phase um, and then we're hoping to have kind of regular touch points directly interacting with individuals from the antinatalist community to support them to do good through career and donations um, so yeah so really getting at those two core um those two core ideas as we were saying supporting oh, antinatalists and disseminating antinatalism well let me rephrase uh, the question how do you intend to avoid the errors of for example uh, the the organizations that i uh, mentioned i think specifically for the suffering focused ethics organizations they're mostly focused on research and i think that's super important um Obviously, the two goals that I mentioned earlier, uh, supporting antinatalists to do good and disseminating the idea of antinatalism as a secondary goal, they both require use of the phrase antinatal, the word antinatalist. Um, the reason being 
the only thing that I think connects us as a community is the label antinatalist. Uh, unlike with vegans, there's not a clear pattern of behavior which only we follow. You know, if you see someone that eats an exclusively plant-based diet and avoids animal products in other ways, they're going to be a vegan. There are plenty of people who don't have children who are not antinatalists. And there are plenty of antinatalists who act differently from each other. As, as far as I'm aware, most antinatalists are not vegan. And yet there are many antinatalists who absolutely see veganism as a key part of antinatalism, the idea that you're bringing beings into existence in mm -hmm. agriculture. So there's not that connecting uh, action. There's not a connecting philosophy. You've got misanthropic antinatalists, antinatalists who idolize nature, you know, the environmental antinatalists. You've got antinatalists who are utilitarians, antinatalists who, who think on balance, like I do, I'm a consequential, some form of consequentialist, think on balance is not a great idea to create children. Then you've got deontological antinatalists who say that procreation is wrong in all circumstances. Like mm -hmm. We've got some serious differences in terms of ideology, serious differences in terms of action. The only thing that unifies us is that label antinatalist. And so mm -hmm. for those two goals, um, supporting antinatalists to do good these are people who identify with the label and spreading the idea of antinatalism we need to use the um we need to use the label in both circumstances calling ourselves suffering focused group wouldn't do that there are already mm -hmm. better organizations out there who are doing that uh trying to fragment into each of our cause areas when there are already organizations like animal advocacy careers who focus yeah. on each of the cause areas without the antinatalist point i do see us as quite different in terms of our Aims. I wasn't necessarily sure, and Lawrence can speak more about Annie, Antinatalist International, but I think that we are quite different in our aims compared to the organizations that you said, and it's important that we main, that we would use the Antinatalist label. Yeah, I already asked a similar question on the pre-conference uh, stream about uh, Annie specifically, Yeah, which I think Lawrence already answered. Yeah, exactly. Um, I do think there are a variety of ways um, that we are different from past ventures like any um but yeah if, pe if people want to get into that they can they can go on to that mm -hmm. stream we can maybe uh link it in this um in the description yeah because um one reason why i'm asking is that um you clearly have, have a have a much broader focus than like other um, antinatalist uh, organizations or other antinatalist uh, groups, like with your four course areas and so forth. And it would seem, I mean, a, a lot of people might disagree, but um, it seems that a lot of uh, things that may or may not be related to antinatalism proper antinatalism itself are kind of lumped together here and kind of promoted as this is what antinatalists should care about so um it's i think it mm, is important indeed if especially if you um choose a name like this to separate your kind of primary concerns which are kind of reflected in uh, by 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 the chosen name from other kind of unrelated or only tangentially related uh, concerns or personal pet concerns well maybe one could call them that and uh, because otherwise people uh, might feel that okay these guys are antinatalists call themselves antinatalists have the organization which they call antinatalist advocacy they um, advocate for a lot of things um, which they call antinatalism, but which really do not necessarily um, represent or um, have to do with antinatalism in the first place. So um, I think this is kind of important to distinguish that that we say as antinatalists, we do antinatalism and as kind of private people or whatever, we also do this other stuff also worth considering. But uh, I think it's uh, it's important like drawing these these uh, distinction because otherwise a lot of antinatalists might feel um, kind of misrepresented um, by, by an organization that calls itself antinatalist uh, something and advocates for things that are either go beyond antinatalism or in certain um instances and we can talk about this too even against antinatalism so i think that if you call yourself an antinatalist organization your focus or your scope is um is very very limited 
and more limited than what is offered by by your organization at least like to uh, to to to, uh, to my eye and uh, maybe other people you know might disagree or might agree with me here mm. can i quickly ask a question lenny just so i yeah. know how to answer the question yeah. so um when you say scope i'm assuming you mean like the cause areas apart from wild animal suffering because you said there were multiple yeah. ones but maybe it was just like a misspeak mm -hmm. Apart from wild animal suffering, what else in the scope uh, do you, do you mm -hmm. think sort of is in is in question here? Because I can understand the yeah. wild animal suffering one, yeah. but the other three cause areas I think fall pretty much um, bang in the middle of of antinatalism. Yeah, I mean, um, like I'm I've already uh, um, explained my own approach to antinatalism uh, in detail on the latest episode of. Uh, of Voidcast, which is a sentiocentric, um, but agent-focused sentiocentric yes. antinatalism. So um, I do think that there is a small but nonetheless significant um, intersection between um, uh, the topic of veganism and uh, the topic of antinatalism. However, only as far as it concerns bringing morally relevant beings into existence once yes. they're already here like everything that happens after um or that uh, you know this i i fully agree that th these are also valid ethical concerns but they fall outside um antinatalism but this is not the the main point that i um wanted to make is indeed the issue of um of wild animal suffering because mm. um i like i fully agree that there's no contradiction at all um if you are both a vegan and an antinatalist i think these both positions whether you accept both or not but i think one at least has to acknowledge that they from certain um perspectives or with certain underlying um uh values that they they kind of go go hand in hand like we have two um negative uh, duties that don't conflict with each other the problem is once you bring wild animal suffering mm. um, into like i and i fully I, i'm and i fully believe that yes even um uh, wild animals are morally um uh, significant like i i fully concede that but i think it is an issue that has to be treated separately because once you bring wild animals into this into the discussion yeah. we're not dealing with a negative duty anymore we're dealing with a positive duty and this positive duty may in certain cases conflict with the core um kind of the the core concerns of antinatalism and at the core of antinatalism i don't think it needs to be restricted to human uh, reproduction but uh, nonetheless this is this is a yeah, core concern core, yeah. yeah and um once you have another concern and an, another ethical concern that goes directly against um against that one against your call against human reproduction then i think we're we're in a kind of dilemma and uh, yeah this maybe um requires some some um yeah. some clarification so um yeah the first thing i wanted to say lenny is i completely agree with you so i think you are probably aware and if anyone listening to this is familiar with my personal channel they're probably aware that i have multiple times uh, quite firmly stated that i don't think wild animal suffering um does fall within the scope of antinatalism itself right and i actually mm -hmm. had this disagreement with um with karima kerma amongst other people mm -hmm. right and i explained my reasons as to why i don't think it falls within the scope mm -hmm. um i think there are um there is a legitimate reason however um for including wild animal suffering uh within the concerns of antinatalist advocacy as an organization i don't think including wild animal suffering as a cause area is necessarily us saying that it is included in antinatalism and that you have to care about it as an antinatalist although obviously on the website we do say that we think an antinatalist should be concerned with it so maybe we need to go back and, and think about the rewording but i don't think yeah. us including it on the website inherently means that we're saying it is part of antinatalism proper yeah the so, reason sorry can i, I just quickly yeah. finish i just like 30 seconds so 
the reason that I believe it's important to include on the website of antinatalist advocacy is because it's a very, um, it's a clear recognition that um, if antinatalism were to be realized, there would be an issue left behind, um, which is a large criticism often launched at antinatalists. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that doesn't mean that it is um, something that is part of antinatalism, but given that if antinatalists were to get what they were uh, wanting, which is moral agents no longer creating sentient beings, mm -hmm. um, that would not mean that wild animals uh, go away. And what I'm not saying is that an you know, antinatalism needs to include wild animals. What I'm saying is, given that antinatalism fully realized would um, leave behind one very important, specific, important moral issue, that is something that antinatalists should bear in mind. And in, in my personal view, I think antinatalists anti should bear in mind and take into consideration when they're deciding where they want to do good. I don't think that's the same as saying that wild animal suffering is part of antinatalism. It's just mm -hmm. an important recognition that it is an, it, it's a unique issue that um, is, I believe, of, should be of concern to antinatalists, which is why I um, supported including it on the, on the website. John, did you have anything mm -hmm. to add to that? Yeah, I do think that uh, by having it as a cause area, people... Because I actually agree that it's because of the things that you mentioned, Lenny. I don't necessarily agree that it is a part of antinatalism. I do mm -hmm. think this is a cause area where antinatalists have an incredibly important perspective, especially as lots of people are promoting rewilding at the moment and bringing lots mm -hmm. of beings into existence to to you know address the climate crisis. Um, also, that there mm -hmm. are anti as we had in the conference with uh, contraceptive techniques, there are um, efforts to address wild animal suffering that do align with antinatalist ethics that I think we could throw our weight behind. So I do think that we, we kind of identified this as a cause area where antinatalists could have a very positive impact, but I would agree that it doesn't come with, from my understanding, it doesn't fall under antinatalism, but there are antinatalists who would say that it does. And I do yeah. think there is a bit of a fundamental point here, Lenny, that I was trying to get to earlier with using the label. Mm -hmm. And that is that we are putting ourselves out there saying that, you know, this is how we understand things. This is the approach that we want to take. If you like it, great. If you don't come and share your criticisms with us, we'll, yeah. we'll try and take them on board. Um, I, I don't know how we're over, like, even by saying that you're a sentient antinatalist, Lenny, you, you've just, you've potentially offended lots of people who describe themselves as antinatalists who don't include animals. And if we're worried about having a different conception of antinatalism to people, like if we spent like obviously we we do want to be cons we do want to bear this in mind but i don't know what it would look like to to take positions that somehow unite everyone because mm -hmm. if we if we just focused on human procreation people would say you're doing it the wrong way or you're a deontologist mm -hmm. not a utilitarian advice but there'll be other things to nitpick um so it's like we could try and boil down to the lowest common denominator and, and not offend anyone, or we can mm -hmm. put out our ideas and people can encourage people to, you know, unite with us on the points of agreement and not be too, you know, not be too dismissive and be kind to some things we were talking about earlier and the points of disagreement rather than mm -hmm. trying to appease everyone by boiling down to the lowest common denominator, which as I said earlier, I don't even know what that would be because there doesn't seem to be much agreement in the antinatalist community over the finer details. I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, necessarily advocating for some lowest common denominator policies here. I just like wanted to say that I, th I do think it's important that you like within your, um, like with your, with the beliefs that you, that you hold, that you are kind of consistent with your messaging. And I do see that, as um, a potential point of um, a point of conflict, kind of in in within the messaging, but if you kind of differentiate this, or if you elaborate on this, or kind of clear up the confusion, what you understand as antinatalism, 
and what are other issues that you personally consider important and i do agree that wild animal suffering is an important ethical issue and I tell you what i'm even open to the idea that the suffering of wild animals including insects by the way um, completely outweighs all uh, suffering humans have ever known however this does not automatically make it part of of antinatalism so yeah. um, there's a, i think this distinction is um is important and uh, if you list it as one of the course uh, four course areas of the organization called antinatalist advocacy i think that this will inevitably create some confusion which could I be definitely agree. yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah no i i i i agree with everything you've just said lenny um mm -hmm. so i agree obviously on the point of the you know the definitional stuff we're in full agreement there and i i think you mm -hmm. you know that from my discussions with kareem and, and others in the past um where i do think we maybe have um not been clear enough is when we included it as a cause area i don't think we were clear enough to explain why we included it and so I do think we did lead to unnecessary confusion as to people thinking mm -hmm. that we were automatically stating that this is part of antinatalism and every, anyone yeah. who disagrees with us is wrong. So yeah. I, and I'm, I'm sure John, you know, agrees with me on this, but please, John, if you disagree, say anything. But um, yeah, I, I, I think we should be clearer in how we present wild animal suffering. Mm -hmm. I, I, look, going forward, wild animal suffering is still going to be an important issue we talk about. But I understand that the framing of it is also very important and we need to take that into account. So when we do the review of the website, and, and I also know I'm saying that quite a lot, and please no one think that we're just saying that to sweep things under the carpet. Like we will be going back through this mm -hmm. and reminding ourselves of everything that we need to review on the website, and we will be doing that. Um, but yeah, I think the framing of wild animal suffering as it relates to antinatalism is um or at least the activities of a antinatalist advocacy um that is something that that we'll look at and and reframe in the ways that we've um that we've just spoken about yeah okay. definitely agree yeah okay yeah, so if I, you, yeah. I just wanted to add that some people have already made a case for the so-called wildlife antinatalism such as magnus winding yes, and yeah. ludwig Rahl. And also David Benatar talks about wildlife. So all the species of animals that are sentient. So it's not really a totally separate case or issue, but maybe the thing that is missing is just making an explicit connection. Yes, I think at least I'm, I know. So with Magnus, I'm not sure about Ludwig, but I, with Magnus, I would say that he's probably using antinatalism in a slightly different way than we are. Mm -hmm. But I know that, um, well, I don't know, but my understanding is that Benatar, when he was talking about wild animals, he was more talking about the part of antinatalism where we recognize that wild animals are also harmed by coming into existence, but less of the sort of moral language, um, if you get what I mean. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of on, um, the, on the level of the pessimistic diagnosis. Yes, which exactly. Which yeah. Schopenhauer and others share. Yes. So this uh, is a question for you, um, Lawrence, because I know you guys have complained about kind of having your position on the so-called ecological niche replacement argument uh, misrepresented and could you perhaps present your position in a way that you don't feel mischaracterizes your position please because i know that this is a major point of um our contention maybe we should uh, talk about it a bit yeah sure i think um i think the main sort of bulk of confusion that has happened around this has been because my thinking on this top, my personal thinking on this topic, um, has changed over um, over the years, um, or over, yeah, over the years. Um, so, and I think what has caused confusion is people seeing videos or discussions from a long time ago and assuming that um, they are accurate for the present day. Um, so. Um, yeah, I actually spoke about this on a stream uh, the other day. Um, so 
yeah, like I said, my thoughts on um, this argument and balancing sort of concerns around antinatalism and wild animal suffering um, have gone back and forth over the years. But um, I think for me, the most reasonable sort of position between the two concerns that I have found and that I occupy at the moment is that um, I obviously don't advocate for anyone to bring any sentient beings into existence. Um, whether they're human or animal. Um, but I think if we advocate for people not to bring sentient beings into existence, we have to recognize that as we were speaking before in the conversation, that does um, leave behind one specific ethical issue, which I think all of us here agree is a big ethical issue, the suffering of wild animals. And I think to balance those two things and how I'm doing it at the moment is that I personally, in my personal capacity, I use my YouTube channel to talk about antinatalism and not bringing new sentient beings into existence. And then I use other capacities I have to do good, such as donating to charity um, to help address the issue of wild animal suffering. So I don't, I have two things I care about, antinatalism and wild animal suffering, and they in some ways pull in opposite directions and that's unfortunate the world does not exist to be ethically convenient um and i do my best to try and address both and i do that by having a youtube channel for antinatalism and with wild animal suffering i donate to charities so i don't think there is a perfect way to remedy the balance of these two things but i try my best and at the moment that, that what i've just said that i do is is how i best navigate that um so that's how i approach the topic of um or that 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 topic i don't know if that was a satisfactory answer if there's any other questions I mean, please go I've, for it uh, julio cabrera says we are all in our way morally disqualified like unable to fulfill uh all of our basic moral duties but let me mm. rephrase the question like would you say that we as a species have a duty to stick around until and only until the problem of wildlife suffering has been solved um i find it very hard to so again, like I said, in, in the past, I would have given a different answer to this, but I'm giving you my answer as I understand it now. I find it very hard to um, understand what it would mean for humanity itself to have a duty. Um, and it's very hard to talk about these things when we don't know exactly what those situations would even look like. But if you're asking me, do I think individual people have a duty to have children so that the human species will continue with the view that one day we will remedy wild animal suffering? Uh, no, no, I don't think people do have that duty. Um, in fact, in fact, I think people shouldn't be bringing sentient beings into existence. But I think that it's good that we are ethically minded in such a way that we use the time we do have since we're here, at least in part to help wild animals, um, uh, you know, Mm. among other morally relevant individuals i mean uh, i think helping uh nothing nothing that's wrong inherently with um, helping wildlife or help reduce wildlife suffering as long as you are here i think the the problem only arises at the point where you say where you encourage people to bring more people in, uh, into existence whether you would do it personally or not in order to yeah tackle so, the problem yeah yeah so um yeah, I, d I don't think I um, am encouraging people. And I may not be remembering every single thing I have personally said in the past. I don't think I ever, again, I can't remember every single thing I've ever said, but mm -hmm. I don't think I have ever encouraged people in the past. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to come in with my perspective on this. So people don't think I've dodged a question or anything like that. Um, in terms of a, a duty for humanity to stick around, again, as I said before, positive duties are really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems very strange for me to say I, it's wrong for me to harm my child by creating them. But then humanity has a responsibility to keep going. Um, that feels very uncomfortable to say that. Mm -hmm. Also, there's no guarantee that if humans do stick around, things will be better because humans, in the case of factory farming, potentially we, we could we could create sentient AI that suffers even worse than wild animals. We could spread to other planets. So I don't mm -hmm. think there's any guarantee that humans sticking around will 
uh, helps our wild animals suffering. Um, last but not least, like even if this is kind of a valid consideration under consequentialist ethics, nonetheless, there are a lot of non-consequentialist uh, yes, arguments at play that you know that you can't just uh, ignore here. Yeah. No, absolutely, and I think that's the point. Is I am a consequentialist, but I do think that. It's important when you're making a really important decision like, should I have a child uh, to consider other normative frameworks? So mm -hmm. as an anti, you know, I think that on balance, it would be bad for my child to create them. And then a deontological antinatalist would say it would be wrong, absolutely wrong to create your child. And for me to do so in the hope that they would trash the environment uh, to not bring wild animals into existence and then have kids who keep doing that. And then maybe one of them one day will have concern for wild animals and will stop the suffering. That that feels like a very strange thing to say. I think I've said repeatedly that if you're an antinatalist that's concerned about wild animal suffering, then if you, you know, don't have a kid to not violate your antinatalist ethics and then donate the money instead to a charity that's concerned about wild animal suffering, that's a much better way of helping wild animals, I think, than... Mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to calculate it would harm my kid to create them, but it would be a lesser harm than uh, not doing so in this kind of thing. I think that's, yeah, it's it's not not a good thing to do to create people to protect wild animals. As as far as I remember from the from the past, um, the the point I was trying to make was that um, we should maybe prioritize. Um, the concern for wild animal suffering in terms of where we put our effort than promoting antinatalism i think is is the furthest i went in in my point um but again if if um if i'm mistaken in that then then um people can can bring that to my attention but nonetheless my current view is the view that i've already expressed earlier in the conversation and when i say prioritize i don't mean that we should sacrifice other ethical issues, like we should sacrifice our negative duties on other ethical issues to pursue the positive duty to wild animals. What I mean by that is when we're thinking about where we spend our time on any ethical issue, we should spend our time on wild animal suffering than on promoting antinatalism. Not that I was saying people should intentionally have children f to help wild animals in some way, um, okay. if, if that makes sense. But again, what I've said in before I uh, forgot what I was saying, uh, th that that's my current view on uh, on um, the balancing okay. of wild animal suffering and and, and antinatalism. But okay, um, I think I get your point. But kind of if as an outsider, it feels a bit uh, like weird to me when an antinatalist advocate behind an organization called Antinatalist Advocacy says we should prioritize other ethical issues over antinatalism. You know, there's my career. Well, I'm confused. Well, well, hang on, Lenny. Th that was said before antinatalist advocacy was even an idea. So mm -hmm. to be fair, uh, uh, that wasn't something I said when antinatalist advocacy was around. As far as I'm yeah. aware, if, if again, if I if I if I did, which I don't think I did, because um, my yeah. my um, understanding on this issue has has evolved since then. Um, then I can understand the confusion it caused. But I yeah. I, I think that was far be far. Uh, before AA was created, okay, I, you know, just uh, it's good, like just a reminder to to have uh, consistent uh, messaging. Yeah, and yeah, when you're navigating these ethical issues, all of which are kind of very important in their own right, you know. Yeah, and and also I do just want to say for anyone who has you know disagreed with me in the past, I obviously it's completely valid to do so and and to criticize things i've said like i like i said you know these are two ethical issues i care about and i found them in the past hard to balance in how in in which one i care about more and um yeah you know sometimes people take time to figure things out and i'm someone who puts a lot of things out in public so um don't necessarily think that one thing i said two years ago just because it's in public means it's exactly the same now um mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I can only apologize for confusion that people have had and yeah. 
And just one thing to follow up as well, a really key practical point. Uh, I said before how we're such a niche community. It's not like we as antinatalists at the moment are going to determine whether or not humans go extinct. So yeah. it's not like we are called on to make the decision as to whether or not humans are going to continue into the future. They are going mm. to continue into the future for now. So I don't think that we have to worry about us uh, you know, affecting or bringing about human extinction with the ideas that we're talking about at the moment. I do think, as to follow up with Lawrence's point, it's important with respect to the end goal, into whether or not that would be a desirable end goal. Um, and in the meantime, if you are concerned about wild animal suffering as an antinatalist, don't worry, you choosing not to have children seems like the better option to me, for sure, uh, than bringing them into existence to alleviate wild animal suffering. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, true what you said. I mean, that as such a fringe community, the impact that we are going to have that goes beyond what's happening happening on the individual sphere is, I think, destined, uh, doomed uh, to, to remain uh, marginal uh, at best. So I think this is important to, to keep in mind also. Uh, with this with this uh, like maximizing uh, efficiency approach now um we're slowly uh like uh, running out of time but um conundrum um, maybe there's uh, another issue that you would like to to raise yeah i would like to raise uh, an issue regarding the effectiveness of antinatalist advocacy so we already went through your goals and we already spoke somewhat about related organizations. So when I look at the cause areas for human procreation, we already have such organizations as Marie Stopes, Population Matters, Gutmacher Institute, Give Well, and many others. For wildlife, we have, for example, Animal Dat sorry, animal-ethics.org, animalinitiative.org, or wildlife. Um, Wild Animal Initiative. Wildanimalinitiative.org. For vegan and animal rights organizations, we obviously have lots of them. So this is the context of various organizations in which we operate and in which we live. So for the first question would be, all of those organizations have resources, people, time, money, structures to work on these issues, and they are focused on these specific issues. Why have another organizations, uh, why have another organization that is split on all of these? Wouldn't it be more Sorry. efficient to strengthen them instead of creating a new thing? Yes, it is better. If we were planning on doing work on these directly, uh, two people with no funding doing this as a part, you know, as a hobby outside of work would not be an efficient way of acting on these. Um, as I mentioned before, our main aim is as a platform or something that can signpost to organizations that are doing the direct work in these cause areas. Um, so yeah, totally agree. If we were looking to work on the problems directly, then it wouldn't be a great use of our time to try and do that, but rather to point people in there in the direction of the organizations already working on it. I think there is a tendency in the vegan community for uh, animal activists to try and reinvent the wheel with everything that they do. Um, and less of an, an atmosphere of let's donate to organizations so they can do the activism. It's all around doing the activism yourself in your free time. Um, and yeah, we're, we're not, we're not, well, we're trying to avoid that pitfall by saying let's support the organizations. There's so much infrastructure out there. So many organizations doing amazing work. Let's support those rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. The, the only thing I'd add is just, um, uh, yeah, I, d I don't think there are any other organizations in existence that are trying to do what what we're doing um, in terms of trying to help nurture uh, more of an anti an antinatalist community or elements of the antinatalist community that are more focused on doing good and with an effectiveness mindset. I'm not sure there's any other organizations doing that. No, not as a there platform is... for the antinatalist community specifically. 
indeed there is no organization that would maybe bring or focus on antinatalists and bring them to those cause areas maybe there isn't but the second goal uh, to strengthen those cause areas seems to be already covered right well just just as a reminder the two the two goals are to help facilitate the antinatalist community in doing more good and the second goal is um helping spread the idea of of antinatalism um so there are there are other organizations that spread the idea of antinatalism like stop having kids for example um but there aren't you know a massive plethora so i think it's it's fine to to also have that as a goal um in our organization given there there aren't many organizations doing it so if i am interested in human procreation then i will most likely be involved in one of those organizations such as Marie Stopes and others if i'm interested in procreation or bringing into existence of farm animals then i will be most interested in those animal rights organizations and if i'm interested in uh, the in the fact that so many wild animals come into existence then i will also be interested in those organizations Yes. that work in this specific cause area who also uh, think about controlling populations of wild animals so it seems to me that this actually um well it's not spreading the idea or the philosophy of antinatalism but there are organizations that in practice are not really differentiable from antinatalists in that they focus or rather they somewhat involve the the diminishment of procreation of certain beings can i just just to clarify so i understand the point you're making is the point you're making that if someone is interested in any of the individual cause areas that we talk about, then they will just go directly to those organizations. So where does our sort of organization fit in and the value it brings? Is that kind of what you're asking or am I misunderstanding? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the, the value that we can bring is simply that a lot of people don't um, donate to those organizations or pursue a career in them or something like that. Um, you know, I know that, you know, obviously you donate, Lenny mentioned he donates, I donate, John donates, but you know, there will be many people who don't donate. There'll be many antinatalists who want to do something, but they don't really know what to do. Um, I've had many of those antinatalists comment on my personal videos, but also email me. So I know there are antinatalists out there and, and, and those are the people that we want to, to help facilitate do good. So I think that's where the value lies. It's somewhat weird that they don't know what to do if there are just so many organizations that do these things. Mate, if people if people knew what to do, then these groups would have all the funding they needed. But a lot of yeah. you know, um, I mean, before we came to these ideas, we we weren't you know donating or or um, or, or knew what to do, right? So we, we had to find our way to the current activities we're doing. Um, and so we want to help others find their way to these activities because we think they're good activities. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in the vegan community, a focus on impact and activism, even amongst the most diehard activists is quite new. I work in the charity sector and the ideas of effective altruism and putting impact first, I, I barely come across them unless I'm speaking with an EA directly. So it's, yeah, I think these ideas, especially taking an impact focus and the the different organizations you named, Conundrum, they're not very well known and if we can support people by pointing them in their direction i think that's a positive thing to do okay i think i am convinced nice we've won <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> yeah. we've conceded I mean, um, 15 points and finally you've conceded one of them <laughs> <other. laughs> um, I mean, you are of course free to say well we listened to all criticisms and we considered them and successfully debunked every single one of them and found out we did nothing wrong 
No, I think there's 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 obviously loads of good things, and like there's obviously I think it's evident to anyone there's a lot of um sort of uh, clarification or reframing we need to do on the website, which is the main place that people are going to see our stuff. Absolutely. Um, so you were already talking about other already established organizations, other groups, other peoples, other associations, other affiliations. And there are certainly a number of um, associations you should consider, either within the antenatalist or within the effective altruist or animal rights scene. But there are also certain associations you may want to avoid. And uh, first of all, let me ask you, um, have you been in touch with uh, Dr. Emil P. Torres? Uh, no, we haven't. Okay, uh, I like I already uh, suggested uh, ha having them on uh, the show in our broadcast uh, crossover episode because they are very very knowledgeable about um, this whole EA movement and the so-called test creel bundle of ideologies that is attached to it and uh, a lot of the things that are going wrong with it. So if you want to avoid um, the pitfalls of other organizations. Um, in that kind of cluster of um, uh, of ideas, then please, uh, you know, uh, invite them. I'm sure they will be more than happy to to share their experience and share their advice uh, with you. Very friendly person, very knowledgeable, also very sympathetic to antinatalism. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, would be would make for a great conversation. I'm sure about that. Uh, you you guys seem to be. Um, very concerned also with the optics of antinatalism and its presentation and its public representation and so forth. And Lawrence recently released a video um, on the so-called red button experiment uh, where he argued that uh, it is not useful for antinatalist discussion that it is in fact detrimental to antinatalist discussion and I remember John also mentioned several times uh, that uh, he is also opposed to pressing said uh, button uh, which I fully agree with. Now if we consider that this is your interpretation, your nonviolent interpretation of antinatalism. I think it's also important to keep in mind that not everyone shares this approach and that there are indeed um, interpretations, variations, fringe variations um, uh, of it that kind of allow for it, that uh, perhaps even uh, actively advocate for it. And I'm curious, like generally speaking, if we like for a brief moment leave aside um, personal friendships, personal enmities, drama and whatever. Like what are your general um, guidelines in hosting or supporting um, or engaging with people who, for example, hold um, views that you disagree with or views um, that can be seen as being in favor of uh, violence of omnicide killing pregnant women uh, like you you pick you name it um, what what are your what are your guidelines in in engaging your, your rules of engagement there do you want me to go john or do you want to go yeah you can go first mate so um i would say so obviously the main place that we would be hosting anyone um would be on on the podcast that john hosts um And my belief is that um, obviously if someone uh, is invited on the podcast and espouses, uh, you know, beliefs uh, or, or views advocating violence, um, then obviously they should be should be questioned. Um, if we're talking about someone who's been invited on the podcast and is not discussing any use of violence then, but but has elsewhere... Um, I think it's somewhat a case by case basis, but I don't necessarily think that it is something that needs to be addressed every time we have someone on the podcast. For example, you know, 
if every time John had someone on the podcast who was not vegan, because both John and I are vegan and we view non-veganism as a form of violence, um, it would just be um, a bit jarring, odd, off topic, and also not that practical to, you know, hold someone to account for every view that we disagree with them on, um, on each podcast episode. Um, also, I think what needs to be taken into account is, as John was saying before, is the tent of antinatalism and the interpretations of antinatalism are quite broad. And so I think it's understandable that when you're talking to other antinatalists, you are going to be having people on that advocate for things you don't agree with. Um, having said all that, neither John or I advocate violence. We oppose the use of violence. Um, yeah, I think you've covered most things there, Lawrence. I think, you know, we've tried to be very charitable and we'll also try and build bridges across organisations, uh, across um, different groups, sorry. So people who aren't antinatalists, people who are antinatalists but disagree with things like uh, veganism, as Lawrence said. So we've tried to have have charitable conversations with people that we disagree with. I agree it's a tricky one, though, Lenny. I think this is an important point. Um, to have a blanket rule around violence, though, as Lawrence said, from both of our perspectives, that would mean that we couldn't speak with non-vegans or at least non-vegans who talk about the fact or make arguments for not being vegan. Um, you know, and obviously they participate in violence in our perspectives in their personal decisions. So it's a tough one. I think it, it is an important concern. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, I guess so far we've just tried to be very charitable and bring people on who we disagree with on certain things and try and find points of common ground. But I do agree mm -hmm. that there is a risk that you end up mm -hmm. platforming um, views that are really, really harmful, mm -hmm. or at least would be harmful if applied. Well, well but, but also remember, if we are platforming those views, then I think we should be um pushing back on them but there's a difference true, between yes. there's a difference between platforming the view and platforming someone who holds a view yes. that is not you know being spoken about at that time definitely um, the, the first is a lot more serious i can see lenny's point though about someone might then go to that person directly or something else they're on and yes. see those harmful views and think that's what we therefore stand by mm -hmm. so maybe there is something there around us making it clear what we don't stand for as well as what we do stand for yeah yeah, and we also discussed um, kind of the, these principles of um, uh, inquiry and uh, like responsible uh, platforming uh, in our episode with uh, with Mark J Maharaj on our podcast. So maybe you can also find some some inspiration there. Lenny, we didn't bring you on for shameless plugs. Or oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, you can, if you want, you can cut no, it. Lenny, he, he was joking. He was joking. Oh, <laughs> okay, it's just my tired uh, neurodivergent brain. No, it's all good. British banter. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. Right. So the last point that we all, I wanted to bring up is that it might make sense moving forward to consider a name change um, that, you know, and choose perhaps a name that causes less confusion and might make, make things uh, easier for you and might even align more with your, uh, with your mission overall. And so would you say you are kind of wedded to uh, the nice sounding antenatalist advocacy uh, name at the moment? Uh, as I, was mentioned before, I think it's important that we include antinatalist in whatever we do for those two points of impact, both the platform and, you know, softly disseminating antinatalism. I think that would be important in the name. Yeah, I think just to add on to that, I don't think we're wedded to the name in terms of we will never under any circumstances change it. But I think we currently don't see a reason to change it. And you know if if a valid enough reason was brought up then then we would consider changing it but um okay. yeah at the moment we're not looking to change it but yeah please bring up any thoughts you have Let, let's see if i can convince you so uh the confusion that i mentioned i think um comes from a conflation of antinatalism and this very very limited and narrow position in creation ethics that is called antinatalism and the much wider field of um, 
suffering focused ethics suffering uh, reduction and a lot of people that i see on reddit and on discourse uh, often confuse these two things they are one and the same and um if your goal your main goal is to reduce suffering and antinatalism is a part of that perhaps even a key part a key component of that but only in so far and if it serves the ultimate um, uh, goal and purpose of reducing suffering then uh, you might also want to consider a name um, that kind of frees you liberates you for, from the inherent limits of the term uh, antinatalism and i know that i mean the word suffering uh, if a, if an organization has the word suffering in its title that's not a particularly nice sounding uh, uh, name either but um, there are alternatives and i want to present you a couple of alternatives that you may you know that you may want to um, consider because then you don't have the problem of differentiating what is internet what like which of our concerns which of our uh, cause areas which of our projects are internationalism in the strict sense of the word and which are other things we consider important under the umbrella term of uh, suffering focus ethics so um and uh, another a new name might uh, give you like more opportunities in this respect uh, in yeah in in these in these respects and also um like uh, solve uh, a couple of issues that come with like what do you actually represent and so forth if you have a uh, a name that is not as like characterized by these limitations you know and if you want, I can I can give you because this is a constructive. Yeah. What What are the examples you have for it? Okay. So um, one uh, thing that I have in mind is um, uh, the word um, abolition, uh, the abolition of suffering, abolitionism. This is a, um, a term that is used by a, like a variety of people, including uh, David Pierce, who. Um, uh, uses it in the context of um, super happiness focused uh, transhumanism, which of course is its own thing. But nonetheless, I think that um, abolitionism and the abolition of suffering, if that is an, kind of the, the, the goal, both with respect to human suffering and non-human suffering, I think um, this is something to consider. Just if you remind you, just the two goals that we talked about before: providing a platform for antinatalists, people who identify with the antinatalist label, bearing yeah. in mind that the label is all we have that unites us as a community, and then as well, um, softly promoting the idea of antinatalism in, with respect to important causes that other people might be already focusing on. So, how, like, how would these names mm -hmm. relate to these particular goals? Um, because if you take a look at the goals and at the points that Conundrum brought up earlier, I don't see a reason to tie yourselves to the antinatalist community and to people who define themselves as antinatalists. Like adopting uh, another name might uh, like free you up in this respect and uh, open you up to, to, to other audiences as well. But... But the the whole point of the organization is to work with antinatalists. So if if we freed ourselves from antinatalism, we would just be a general organization that wants people to do, you know, effective activism of some sort. Mm -hmm. But and bearing in mind that there are plenty of other organizations in the suffering focus space who already do this kind of thing. Yeah. And we're but, acting as a platform to point people towards but, organizations. But like, like we doing we, direct work. Like the, the whole point of antinatalist advocacy is we want to focus on antinatalism. So to say that we should rebrand so that we don't focus on antinatalism is kind of telling us to just shut down the organization. No, not, that's not at all uh, what I um, uh, what was pointing out. Um, I don't like I don't uh, want you to shut down your organization. Um, I just want you to. Um, kind of have a name that causes perhaps less um, confusion and that is has a clearer message that aligns with your very noble goals of um, 
of reducing suffering and by having antinatalism in the name, I think you kind of rob your, yourselves of, of, of your chances in this. Let, Lenny, remember that the two aims of antinatalist advocacy aren't to reduce suffering. They are to, I mean, that for some people will be the ultimate goals. For some people, mm. it will be to reduce suffering. For some people, it will be to reduce rights violations or whatever, or to increase virtuous behavior. But for antinatalist advocacy, the two goals are to facilitate antinatalists specifically to do good and do good effectively. And the other one is to propagate the idea of antinatalism. N nowhere in the two goals does it mention the reduction of suffering, even though that may be a sort of ultimate thing that certain antinatalists will appeal to. Yes, but nonetheless, um, if you take this utilitarian approach of um, doing good, then you have to like quantify uh, and, well, and this this good that you do or aim to do yes but and remember do, doing good isn't just utilitarian right someone could cash it out. It, it would be consequentialist mm -hmm. but someone could cash it out in terms of doing good is reducing the number of rights violations rather than increasing utility but nonetheless i think i mean i read the um the texts on your website i listened to your podcast and i think what you are the version of antinatalism that you promote or, or the ideas in general that you promote seem to align most closely with what is commonly n known or called uh, suffering focused ethics which is completely fine and um like my suggestion would be would be simply to to have a less limiting uh a less limiting name personally i think opening up the name would actually limit the organization more i'm i mean if you consider um how fringe group uh the antinatalist community if there even is such a thing is overall i i doubt that i mean um you could be one of the few organizations that makes antinatalism kind of part definitely part or component of the um, agenda as it is now. Um, but uh, I don't see why you should kind of restrict yourselves to the tiny audience of uh, antinatalists. Maybe this gets to your po point earlier about me being naive about the shape of the antinatalist community or overly optimistic, but antinatalists, I think, are in a unique position to do good in many ways through not having children. Um, through taking actions, lots of antinatalists take actions in their own lives, like going vegan, for example. Um, also, the secondary goal of AA of pushing an antinatalist message in cause areas that other people are working on. I think that there are reasons why the antinatalist community has this wonderful opportunity to have a positive impact. Um, but again, it's all tied to the antinatalist community in particular, and we would lose that if we opened up our name to something more general. So uh, just to make sure I, I got that right. So so your main mission is to kind of uh, encourage uh, antinatalists, like people who I who identify as antinatalists, to do good uh, in in the form of making donations or engaging in activism and um, other kinds of uh, activity that may or may not have to do. Uh, with antinatalism directly, right? Well, we think that it does have to do with the only thing that we think of the four cause areas, the only one yeah. that we could concede doesn't have to do with antinatalism mm -hmm. directly, or at least on this call, is wild animal suffering. Again, there are antinatalists who believe that it does have to do with antinatalism directly. I mean, the, the point I'm making is that, um, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything like inherently wrong with, with a suffering-focused um, utilitarian uh, approach to ethics and encouraging people to to participate in that uh, not at all uh, and nor do i think that there's something inherently wrong with the antinatalist position as a philosophical position now but i think it is important to acknowledge that these two things are not um one and the same and uh when kind of going through your material um then I get, I personally get the impression that these two um, uh, ideas, these two philosophies, which have some overlap, are kind of are not properly differentiated. 
you know, this is kind of, this is just the impression that I get. And, and maybe, you know, you can consider this, uh, this point and, uh, you know, or maybe you can just reject it and say, well, Len Lenny is just being nitpicky here. But uh, it's, uh, it's so just something that I uh, want to bring up because it is uh, something that has indeed caused uh, a lot of confusion in antenatalist communities uh, on Reddit, Discord and elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, I... I completely take the point that um, some of the framing in some of the like the maybe the writing on the website or things we've said publicly could be confusing the two or could uh, could confuse people into thinking that um, they're the same thing. Um, but I think that can be remedied in ways other than changing the whole organization's name. Um, I, I just don't think that is warranted, especially when I do think that the name nicely fits with the two main goals we have um i i don't mm -hmm. see it as at all misleading when it comes to the two main goals we have um but i i i can understand that some of the specific things we have said in the past or things on the website yeah. um could cause that confusion but I, I don't think it's the name causing that confusion i think it's just we maybe have to reframe some of the things that we say on the website or elsewhere um but i don't think it warrants a name change yeah, I definitely agree. I think the the way that we've framed things on the website and elsewhere is less important, really, than the name. I think the name really gets to the core of what we're trying to do. Okay, well, just something to um, to consider. One of the reasons uh, I brought this up and I suggested, you know, considering a name change is that I know a couple of people might feel um, kind of misled um, by the title and the name antenatalist uh, advocacy in light of like recent uh, statements uh, that uh, John in particular has made uh, relating to um, antenatalism and antenatalists making sperm donations. Is this, do we have uh, time for that or um, do you want to cover this another Yeah, point? I think I, I probably won't be going to go into too much detail at the moment, just because I am going on uh, Mark's channel in my own private capacity soon, his his YouTube channel, to talk about this in detail. Um, I do think it is relevant, though, for a couple of things that we've talked about earlier. So just to recap, mm -hmm. um, in short, I stated my view, which you know I, I do stand by, that in a hypothetical situation where sperm donation didn't, uh, lead to an increase in the amount of human procreation going on. I can see an argument for that not violating antinatalism. Um, other people disagree. Um, In including myself. People, uh, potentially people of a more deontological bent than myself as a consequentialist from my perspective, if, you know, if the consequences aren't particularly different, um, you know, if, the, if no more procreation is happening, then I can see it being at least allowable with the with the caveats that I gave, uh, and you can see those caveats written out in full under the video, but I do think it gets to points that we raised earlier around different understandings of antinatalism and how we address those, because some of the criticism I saw was around how people felt understandably that the that their version of antinatalism isn't represented in antinatalist advocacy, um, which I think has led to some people part of the, you know people wanting to see a name change in this kind of thing and you know as i said earlier i think the name is the only thing that the community has to hold us together to be honest it's the only thing that holds us together is people identifying with the antinatalist label and i think it is an interesting and a really important point as to how we deal with differences of opinion within the community because mm -hmm. if we, we could try and as I said before, we could try and boil down to the lowest common denominator. I don't think that would work practically. People would still find things to disagree about. Um, and yeah, I, I, I don't know how to, how to kind of move part, not what more to say other than I have a different understanding of antinatalism. I think that's fine. Other people who have a different understanding of antinatalism than me, um, I'm happy to come together and work on the points that we do disagree on. Uh, sorry, other point. Work on the points that we do agree on and then, you know, have, you know, polite conversations like this one on the points that we do disagree on. Um, yeah, I just, you know, in, in terms of changing the name because it doesn't align with people's understandings of antinatalism, 
I don't know how, like, or I don't know who could use the label of antinatalism if they were trying to appeal to a universal understanding, because I don't think there is one. Yes, but nonetheless, I think that these um, statements that have kind of generated quite a bit of uh, outrage um, for a lot of people, and not just random people, but people who, who uh, are very knowledgeable and have a, have a good un and solid understanding of, of the philosophy, that they feel that this kind of violates one of the core um, aspects and one of the core issues and core tenets of the antinatalist position. So this is just something that like, one should be mindful of when uh, you know, you have an, uh, when you're kind of bound to an organization that calls itself antinatalist advocacy and all of these issues could be easily resolved by simply by um, consider by, by choosing a, a different name. You know, you don't have to. That, that is true, your, Lenny. Yeah. That, that would apply for everyone, though. So anyone who wants to use the label antinatalist, whether that's to create a group or bring antinatalists together, they could avoid offending antinatalists by not using the antinatalist label. But then I think that just makes the antinatalist label unusable. If the reason that you're not using it is because you have a different understanding of antinatalism. I do agree that this wasn't a this wasn't something that I should have brought up. This is, you know a view that I'm not even particularly tied to, as I said, in all the caveats, this isn't something that I advocate. It's not something that I'm planning on doing myself. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see a bunch of, you know, little Johns running around because I won't be donating to purpose. I don't advocate other people to, I can just see a case for it in consequentialism, and not violating my understanding of antinatalism, but there is one guaranteed way um, of not offending antinatalists with the antinatalist label. And that's not using the label. But then, as Lawrence Knight said, I think that there are merits to using the label. And but there are also, and this is kind of why I brought this up. There are also st like strategic, purely strategic um, considerations against uh, against using the label with its uh, inherent limitations. No, that's totally fair. And there are also strategic limitations, uh, strategic considerations in choosing your battles and mm -hmm. bringing something up that you don't advocate and won't be doing. Because, um, as you know, under the antinatalist advocacy label, that wasn't a smart move on my part, as it says under the video. I do regret bringing it up. Cool. Um, well, I think that is everything we were going to cover today. Um, so, should we just quickly go to Conundrum and Lenny, just in case there's any final closing things you wanted to say before we finish? Um, and then John and I will do a quick closer. I mean, I don't have much to say. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, yeah, thank you for having having us on. Thank you for hearing us out. And um, yeah, hope you could find some, you know, value in in the discussion and maybe take one or two things into um, consideration um, for for the future of your organization. You know, for your, your stuff um, moving forward and. Yeah, I think that's all I had to say. Yeah, thank you for having us on. And I'm looking forward to see the new version of the Antinatalist Advocacy website. Especially the criticism section. Uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to you both. Um, well, one for coming on, all the effort that you've put in as well, and other people have fed into uh, this panel. Um, I hope you feel like we've responded fairly to the criticisms. I think we could understandably spend a lot longer going through them um you've definitely raised a lot for me and lawrence to consider and there'll be quite a few changes i think that we'll want to make after this um but yeah thank you so much and people are watching listening sorry let us know your thoughts in the comment section your thoughts on the crit criticisms how we've responded to them changes you'd like to see that kind of thing yeah and i don't have anything to add on top of what john said so i just want to say thank you both for the effort you put in and also coming on um, and giving up your time to um help us with this yeah thanks again guys thank you very much and see you next time see you bye bye thank you for tuning into this episode of the antinatalist advocacy podcast if you like what you heard today please subscribe so you don't miss future episodes we'd also be really grateful if you could help us get the word out there by sharing this episode far and wide as well as giving us a positive rating on whichever platform you're listening to us on 
To find out more about AA, including careers advice, donation recommendations, and different ways to have a positive impact, you can go to our website at antinatalistadvocacy.org. To keep up to date with what we're up to, feel free to subscribe to our monthly newsletter and follow us on your favourite social media platforms. Links to all of the above are in the description. As always, we are hoping you will join us in our antinatalist advocacy.